So at the beginning it was evolving the magnetic field uh, using concurrent transport, uh, but then since we wanted to move to the mesh refinement, we decided to move to evolve the vector potential. And the uh, main difference with Illinois GMHG is that we use a non stagger vector potential. This is due to the fact that when I implemented the, the vector potential inside, inside the WISC MHD, there was no way to have a stagger variable to win carpet at the adaptive mesh refinement time. And I was too lazy to do the stuff that Zach did because so in my case, I just have uh, the, the vector potential center in the grid. We use the modifying Lorentz gauge, which was introduced by Zach and, and uh, collaborators, and then we use some standard techniques from the, uh, from the computation of the fluxes and the record structure. So the HLE flux uh, formula, so the approximate HLE approximate Riemann solver, and the piecewise parabolic method for record structure, which is a third order record. The WISCAM HD code has been used mainly for binary neutral star mergers, but we have also a few simulations of uh, single uh, neutral stars. We also have one <laughs> paper on uh, supermassive binary black hole merger in magnetized plasma. This is a work that I did when I was at Goddard uh, ages ago. And then uh, we also did some simulation of neutral star black hole mergers in the past, but we never published them. <laughs> so it was used also in that concept, but this was never, was never published. What I'm going to talk about today is about uh, our work on binary neutral star measures. So, in the case of binary neutral star, the dynamics can be very complicated, and you can have uh, several post merger uh, scenarios depending on the equation of state of neutral star matter, which is something that we don't know, and the total mass of the binary. So, here I like uh, four different channels two in uh, red, which I call the high mass scenario, and two in blue, which I call the low mass scenario. In particular, Ricardo Chol will give a talk in which he will focus on this low mass of the scenario. So let's suppose that the total mass of your binary is much larger than the maximum mass that can be supported by your equation of state for a uniformly rotating neutral star. That in that case, you are in this red channel scenario. So if the total mass is very large, much larger than the maximum mass that you can support for a uniformly rotating neutral star, then after merger, you form immediately a black hole plus possible amplification disk. In this scenario, actually, the amplification disk may be very small. It also depends on the mass ratio of the system. If you are just above the maximum mass for uniform rotation, then you form an object that, by definition, is called an hypermassive neutron star. This is an object that is supported by differential rotation of the stellar layer of the star. Essentially, you form an object that is almost uniformly rotating the core and then has a, has a differentially rotating envelope. And this one survives for the order of tens of milliseconds, uh, less than one second in general, and will collapse the public hole surrounded by an attrition disk. For example, the case uh, that Zach showed in the movie before is the case of an hypermassive neutral star that survives for a few tens of uh, one milliseconds. If instead you lower still the total mass of the binary, then you can go to this blue channel, the low mass of binary neutral star <coughs> scenario. So let's suppose that the total mass of your binary is the over the maximum mass you can support for a non-rotating neutral star, what is called uh, the TOV solution, total mass of an high volcan solution, but it's below the maximum mass for a uniformly rotating neutral star. Okay? So here you have the maximum mass for a non-rotating neutral star, this is a maximum mass for a uniformly rotating neutral star, and the total mass of the binary is somewhere here. Then by definition, what you form is what is called a supramassive neutral star. This is a neutral star that is stable as long as it spins. So it can be supported by uniform rotation, and in principle could also live forever. Now, as we know, neutral star has magnetic phase. So, for example, if we observe pulsars, we see that their period increases, and this is due to the fact that essentially you have electromagnetic radiation due to the magnetic fields, and this reduces the kinetic energy of the object. So, when you form a supermassive neutral star, this supermassive neutral star will also be magnetized, and so you expect to have a spin down time scales so that depends on the magnetic field effect. If the magnetic field is very strong, like take the 15 and 16 gauss, then this object will collapse, for example, at a scale of one hour. 
and then we collapse the black hole, and then maybe an accretion leaf. A flare maybe because we cannot follow this channel through collapse of black hole numerically. Okay, this time scale is too long to be simulated. Why we can uh, simulate the red channel from the spiral merger up to collapse of black hole in the disk? This one takes too long. We can study the formation of the supermaximum of star, but it will not be possible to follow time scale of the order of hours in numerical dissimulation. And then you have this scenario, which is the string case, in which the total mass of the binary is even below the maximum mass for an all rotating neutron star. In that case, what you form is just a stable neutron star that will live forever. Now, if you look at the distribution of masses in the binary pulsars so that we see binary neutron star system that we observe in our galaxy, and uh, you look uh, at the equation of state that we have around that can support at least two solar mass neutron stars, then you will see that most channels will be, most of the binary neutron system will go or through an hypermassive neutron star phase or through a supermassive neutron star phase. This is something that we discussed in a paper with uh, Tony Piro and uh, Rosalba Berna. Okay, so if you assume that the distribution of binary neutron system reflects the distribution of binary neutron star in our galaxy, then most of the merger should produce an hypermassive or a supermassive neutron star. So these two scenarios are probably the most probable scenario for a binary neutron star merger. In the case of GW 170817, the first binary neutron star merger of Terra, we don't know what happened after the merger because the gravitational signal is emitted after the merger is a frequency that are too high for the current gravitational wave detectors to be detected. There was a search for a post merger signal, but there was no signal found because of the sensitivity of these detectors. But it's very possible that it went through one of these two channels. You, if you combine the gravitational wave observation together with electromagnetic observation, it seems that probably this one was the, the most powerful channel in the case of the Okay, but there is a question mark there. So I'm going to present uh, two papers that we published in the last few years uh, about these two scenarios, so the high mass scenario and the low mass scenario, and then I say after the coffee break there will be a talk by Ricardo Solfi uh, presenting a paper which I published uh, on uh, this low mass scenario. So, the end scenario is very interesting because you form uh, a black hole plus an accretion disk, and this system can power relativistic jets and give rise to a short gamma robust. So, in uh, 2016, uh, there was a paper by Milton Lewis, a collaborator, where they used the Illinois GRMHD code, and they saw the formation of a relativistic jets after the merger of a binary cluster system. So, what they considered was an equal mass binary cluster system with a, a simple uh, gamma low equation of state, what we call the other fluid equation of state and a very large magnetic field. The idea of using a very large magnetic field is due to the fact that, as uh, David discussed before, we, we don't have the resolution uh, high enough to be able to resolve this small scale turbulence that happens during the merger, and therefore we cannot really resolve the magnetic field amplification that we expect during the merger. And so what the group in Illinois did was essentially to start the rating to something that was already high, and to see the effects of this magnetic field on the post merger evolution, in particular, they saw the production of relativistic jets. In this case, instead, in our paper, we decided to start with something that was more uh, astrophysically realistic, so a magnetic field at a maximum 10 to 12 Gauss, which is the maximum, more or less, you expect in binary neutron star system. And then we considered uh, uh, some different models. So we use uh, a simple, either fluid equation of state with an equal mass system, which is the same was used in the rate of It's also the same was used in an old paper by Charles Salami and others, which was also called the DC link paper. And then we also considered an equal mass model. And at that time, this was the first time actually an equal, an equal mass simulation was done for a binary system in GRMHD. And then we also used a different equation of state, H4, which is a bit more uh, realistic than the other fluid. And in that case, both we consider an equal mass system, so 1.4 and 1.4 solar masses, as well as an equal mass system with a mass ratio of 0 0.8. So we change the equation state, and we also study the effect of mass ratio. And we also consider a different magnetic field line that's for the case of the equal mass other fluid case. The idea of this paper was to study the magnetic field evolution to understand which kind of structure you form at the end of this merger. Since at that time, there was a bit of controversy. Like there was this paper, Rezzola, Giacomazzo et al., also known as the BCD paper, in which it was, uh, this system was evolved uh, and there was this formation of a very nice collimated structure around the spin axis of the core. Then a uh, few years later, there was a paper by the group of Shibata, was the future of 2014, in which they were claiming that there was no other structure. And then we have the work uh, which was contemporary with this, with all its collaborators, in which they see a relativistic jet, but just for one model. 
And so we decided to investigate a bit more uh, what's going on in, in these systems. So here I have a movie from the H4 Ivan Max case. Uh, this is a movie I'm very proud of because this is the movie also was used to open an SF press conference to announce the discovery of presentation with senior companions of Star Match or something. It's part of this movie. The visualization was done by Wolfgang Kastan. And what you see here at the rest mass density in the volume rendering, and then, well, at the bottom, of the you can see that this is yellow, but it's not so important. It's the gravitation we see now as a function of time, so let me play the movie. So you have the two star stars orbiting uh, around uh, each other, so a few orbits. Uh, I think it was five orbits in total in this case. Then you have uh, the merge, then the formation is either mass in neutral star, and this case uh, survives for around 10 milliseconds. There is matter, is low density matter is ejected into the shocks that are produced the merge, and then you find a collapse of the core surrounded by an accretion disk. Now, once you have the formation of the black hole plus the accretion disk, the gravitation wave signal goes to zero. Okay, so the gravitation wave signal comes mainly from this part, and then you have the post merge part, and then once you produce the black hole and the disk, the signal goes to zero. But from an electromagnetic point of view, in particular from the point of view of Chicago gas, this is the moment <coughs> where things become interesting. Because this is the kind of scenario that if you have a magnetic field and in this, kind of, in this kind of simulation, you could possibly launch a relativity jet. And so it is saying that we had a look at the magnetic field structure and the magnetic field evolution, and these are some connections from uh, this paper, from our paper, in which with color you see the rest mass density of the system, and with lines you see the magnetic field. So these are the initial data that you can start cutting out. Since we use the ideal LHD approximation, the magnetic field was confined inside, uh, initially confined inside the neutral star, and this is what you see here. Then you have the time of the merge, the formation of the mass neutral star, and these are the two snapshots toward the end of the simulation where you have the black hole, which you cannot see. You see the mirror behind the magnetic field lines, and then you have the torus. This corresponds to what by the isodensity surface of 10 to the 10 grams per cubic centimeters. And then you have this low density funnel aligned with the black hole spin axis, and this yellow surface corresponds to uh, a density of 10 to the 8 grams per cubic centimeter. And what we saw is that uh, in the torus you have mainly a toroidal component of the magnetic field, and magnetic field is mainly toroidal, while instead of aligned with the spin axis of the black hole, you get this sort of a polycolloidal structure, which is very nice because it's actually what you see when you have the formation of a relativistic jet. Unfortunately, I'm going to comment a bit more on this. At the end of our simulation, we didn't see an actual outflow coming from the panel, so we didn't have a jet. We had this very nice order and magnetic structure to mount the jet. What was interesting is that we had a look at the structure also for the other cases, so when you change the equation of state and the mass ratio, and bottom line, you always get the same structure. So we believe that the results that were obtained the group, by the group of Illinois in the paper and published in the paper by the USA 2016 should be general, so it should not be dependent on the fact that they choose uh, another to the question of state, because this kind of structure forms uh, at the end of the evolution of any, any hypermass in the star collapse of the core. So here, for example, you have the structure of magnetic field lines on top is for the H4 equation of state, equal mass and equal mass, and the bottom, the either two case, uh, are equal mass and equal mass. So this kind of structure seems to be very common in this kind of scenario. So as long as you have an hypermass in the star collapse of the core, it seems that you should always produce this kind of, of magnetic field structure. As I said, we didn't see a uh, relativistic jet coming out of that, and so these are two uh, snapshots for the H4 equation of state model. On top is the equal mass system, on the bottom is the unequal mass system. These are snapshots on the gridonal plane. And then in both panels, what you see is the top half, the velocity, the z component after the, of the velocity. So red will mean, will mean that you have something outgoing, blue it means you have the flow in flowing. And then the bottom half is that is the ratio of magnetic pressure to gas pressure. And uh, if you see something toward white in the bottom panel, it means that you start with something magnetically dominated. So if you look, for example, to the equal mass scenario, you see you have the black hole, and if you look at the velocity, essentially the plasma is just falling down the black hole. So you don't have any jet coming out, you don't have any red there. And if you look at this region here, you see that the panel is not magnetically dominated at all. So if you're familiar, for example, with the Planck's nine mechanism, one of the most powerful mechanisms to extract energy from the system, power electricity jets, you really need to have a magnetically dominated panel if you want to produce a electricity jet. This is something that was described in the original paper by Marcus Snyder, but was also shown, uh, so numerically 
for example, uh, by Commissario Embarco in 2009, which decided which kind of condition you need in order to launch a jet, and the condition is to have a magnetically dominated fan. So the idea, for example, that uh, we don't, didn't see a jet is because essentially we started with a low magnetic field, like a Gauss, and our resolution was not good enough to see this large magnetic field amplification on that. So in the case of Ruiz and Etal, they were starting with a very large magnetic field, so it was possible for them to have a magnetically dominated fan and therefore launch a relativistic jet. Now, there is something that can be done in this, so David already mentioned the uh, uh, a way to take into account this smaller scale structure. And uh, so I will be very fast on this. I just wanted to show you a snapshot of, of a very old simulation by Luca Bayotti, Mia, which I was called in 2008. And I think this was actually the first simulation to actually show with an image the formation of the chemical elements instability in the minor in the merger simulation. So what you have here is the rest mass density during merger. So color is different value of the rest mass density. And then the arrow is developed in field. And maybe you cannot really appreciate it from, from the distance, but there are the formation of vortices. So there are small vortices here, small vortices here, and there are a couple of smaller here and here, and those on this direction. And these are the vortices that are formed by the chemical and stability due to the fact that when these neutrons start entering contact with each other, you have a shear interface, so you have a discontinuity actually in the velocity, and you can see this discontinuity here. This is from a paper by Kent and Jim Collaborators. This is the X component of the velocity as a function of y during the time of the merger, and you see that there is a discontinuity in the velocity. Then you go from 0 0.1 to minus 0 0.1. This happens simply when the two are in contact with each other. And this is known to be unstable and the give rise to this Kelvin analysis stability. The role of Kelvin analysis stability is very important because even if you start with a fully colloidal magnetic field, the formation of this vortex to be curve the magnetic field lines can produce a strong toroidal component and in particular can amplify the magnetic field of several orders of magnitude. And it is something that was, for example, shown in a, uh, was shown in a paper by Kyuchi and collaborators, so was a paper in 2015, in which they used a resolution 17.5 meters, and with that resolution they were able to see an increase of three orders on magnetic magnetic field, but still they didn't reach saturation in the magnetic field drop. And this is incredibly expensive. And the typical resolution we use in binary star measures is a factor of 10 uh, larger than this, okay, order of 200 meters. Indeed, the simulations by Kuch et al. just to sh show the magnetic field amplification and then they stop at the run because it was too expensive to continue to run to see what's going to happen after that. So, a fix for this could be, for example, to use some sound grid modeling. This is uh, a paper I published in 2015. It was in collaboration with Stata Perna and then with collaboration with uh, uh, Andrew McFadden, uh, uh, Jonathan Drake, and uh, uh, Duffel. In which what we did was essentially to take the results of local simulation of uh, turbulent fluid, which were done by uh, Andrew McFarland and, and uh, collaborators, and try to learn uh, what they saw in these local uh, simulations and implement a sampling model such that we could have a magnetic field amplification in the regions where we have turbulence. I'm not going to go into the details. But essentially, this uh, the plot of the average value of the magnetic field as a function of time. So the blue line is a standard ideal MHD simulation with a standard resolution of 200 meters, more or less. You start with an average field of 0 to 11 Gauss. You reach time of merger, which is this vertical dashed line, and you grow essentially not even on one upper line. So it is a very small growth. If you instead you take into account the small scale effects, then at uh, the time of merger, you can get an amplification of several other magnets. So you start with something that is an average of 10 to 11 Gauss, and then it goes up, up to 10 to 16 Gauss. This uh, local simulation of uh, Vake and uh, make Jonathan Vake and to make actually show that in principle, during binary personal measure, the magnetic field should reach equipartition with the kinetic energy of the turbulent flow. So an average value of 10 to 16 Gauss is what you should expect after the merger of a binary process. And here on the right, uh, you have essentially something similar. You have the energy instead of the average value of the magnetic field as a function of time when using the saturation model and when using different resolution. They essentially show that you reach saturation with the saturation model. Okay. You increase the resolution, you increase further resolution, then at certain point it stops growing. Okay. So this is what regards uh, high mass binary neutrons of system. Let's discuss then about this uh, blue channel, so the low mass scenario. And I'm going to report on a 
paper that we published two years ago, that was the most Ricardo Sorte, and then Ricardo is going to speak about a more recent paper in which it was a more detailed study of this uh, post merger scenario, but a very long simulation, probably the longest one that today. So in this paper, uh, we consider the different binary neutral sun system. We consider two different mass ratio, equal mass, and a system with some mass ratio of 0.9. And we consider three different equations of state, APR4, MS1, and H4. APR4 still satisfies the constraint that comes from gravitational waves. MS1 is ruled out, H4 is for the line. All these are piecewise polytropic equations of state, so they are cold, and then we have a thermal component to them with a simple gamma law with a derivative uh, of 1.8. Something interesting of this paper is that the whole model had the same total gravitational mass and infinity, 2.7 solar mass, and also the same total magnetic energy. Okay? So the total gravitational mass and the total magnetic energy was the same for all the models. So the changes were really due to the mass ratio and the equation of state. The magnetic energy corresponds essentially to the initial magnetic field of the order 10 to 15 Gauss. Since we really wanted to study what was the effect of the magnetic field in the post merger, and since we don't have the resolution high enough in order to study magnetic field amplification, we started with something that was larger from the beginning. This is a movie that I did up recently. It's also available on YouTube as the previous one, and it's the first the model, which is the master with the APR4 equation of state. And again, uh, you are going to see different colors, volume rendered for the rest of entity. In this movie, you also have the, the color bar. Okay? So you get an idea of the ranges of the mass. This movie is just going to play faster than the other one. So you have the two neutral stars, which are spiraling around each other. Then at a certain point, they merge. And now their mass is not high enough to produce an hypermassive neutral star, but we produce a supermassive neutral star. So an object that they say they can survive for hours or even longer. So what you see here at the end is essentially the electron mass neutral star. This is the, the core, let's say, of the electron mass neutral star. And then it's surrounded by a disk of matter. And, and then we stop the, the boom here, because this can go on for four hours. And it will jump to the three milliseconds. We started the gravitational wave signal from this model. So this is a figure that I like a lot, because this is all equal mass model. As I said, the gravi total gravitational mass of the is the same, they are all equal mass, so this model, they are all have the same chirp mass, okay, to use a quantity that is measured from gravitational wave signal. And so in all models, you see the spiral phase, the direction of vertical lines, the time of merger, and then you see that there are differences in the post-merger phase due to the different equation of state. So again, the magnetic energy is the same, the gravitational mass is the same, the only difference is the equation of state. So in the case of the H4 equation of state, the mass is 2.7 solar mass, it's large enough that it produces an hypermassive neutral star that survives for around 20 milliseconds and then collapses the black hole. So you see the spiral, the merger, then the uh, emission coming from the hypermassive neutral star and then collapse the black hole. In the case, instead of the APR4 equation of state, the mass is such that instead of producing an hypermassive neutral star, you form a supermassive neutral star. So this object is not going to collapse through the black hole at, at least for another hour or more. So you have the spiral, the merger, and then the gravitational is coming from this supermassive neutral star. And then at this point, you just stop the simulation for computational reasons because it's too expensive to go. The most extreme case is the MS1 system. In this case, for this equation of state uh, that can support very large masses, uh, the total mass of the system 2.7 is such that uh, you actually produce uh, a stable uh, neutral star. So this one will not collapse. And you can see all models uh, here at the bottom, you have the instantaneous frequency of function of time, and you can see that it's a characteristic frequency coming after the merger. And so something that we had a look at, for example, was the effect of the magnetic field on this post-merger gravitational wave emission, in particular of the main frequency at which the gravitational wave signal is emitted. So here we have the spectrum, uh, and uh, here we have the frequency kilohertz, this uh, uh, advanced LIGO, advanced Virgo, and this the uh, Einstein telescope. And uh, you should compare the green uh, solid line uh, together with the green uh, dotted line. So the green solid line is the one of these uh, simulations uh, that I showed you before. Actually, in the movie I showed you before, with the large magnetic field. And the dotted line is the same system in which you stand uh, your remove magnetic field. So you got that system without the magnetic field. And if you zoom here, you see that the difference <coughs> of the peak is essentially negligible. Uh, so it looks like the magnetic field doesn't have a strong impact on the position of the peak. And that is a good news, because if you want to use this peak, for example, to infer the properties of the post-merger remnant, which is something also David mentioned in his talk, 
you cannot, you can ignore essentially magnetic field effect, okay? Because those will not move the position of the speaker. So the position of the speaker should be strongly correlated with the question of state and not with the magnetic field. The, the effect of the magnetic field on the amplitude is still a question mark. In our case, we didn't see a stronger impact on the amplitude of gravitational signal, but other people think different. This is this. And then I want to just discuss the last couple of minutes. <laughs> so this was not with whiskey and HD, there was no magnetic field in this because whiskey and HD can only support up to this wise polytropic equation of state. And as Federico told you yesterday, we were working on a new code that is studied low synchro tabulated equation of state. So this is a work that is studied using the whiskey thermal, which is a code developed by Wolfgang Kastan, which cannot evolve magnetic field, so it's not MHD, but can use a tabulated equation of state. And in particular, it's a nice work because what we did was to simulate binary or star mergers using a new equation of state, which is called the PL equation of state, on the known name of the authors, Bombach and Lomoteta. This is an equation of state that's been developed by nuclear physicists. It's an equation of state that satisfies all constraints that come from modern nuclear experiments. It satisfies the constraint from GW17 or 17 So it's an equation of state that at the moment satisfies essentially all constraints that are available up to now. And so they, they decided to give us this equation of state in order to see then what kind of gravitational signal you can get from the this system. And uh, again, we consider this equation of state, and then we also consider another couple of models instead with a similar equation of state from a point of view of comp composition, but computed with different methods. So both equation of state essentially give you matter composed of neutron, protons, electron, muons. What changes is how you compute essentially the interaction between nucleons inside the neutron star. And so we did a simulation of this, this equation of state, and this is, for example, a starting natural of the evolution on the top. You have the rest uh, mass density evolution. At the bottom, you have the evolution of the temperature, in which you see, in particular, the shock and matter that is ejected after the major, that is very hot. And in particular, at the end, you see the formation of a, of a neutral star with this kind of two hot spots, which seems to be quite a common feature when you evolve those to the Conclusion, uh, I just want to point out again that we are working on a code which was presented by Filippo Cipolletti in order to deal with magnetic field, the tabulated equation of state, as well also taking into account the mean emission, which is something we are doing in collaboration with Lorenzo Sala. And we are doing something similar that, uh, that is exactly in the sense that we are benefit, benefiting a lot of public level of code. So, for example, we are using Yosomni as an uh, equation of state driver, and for the leakage scheme, we are going to use the money leak, which is also public level of and then from the point of view of simulation, we are doing some neutral star molecule simulation design with Whisk MHD in collaboration with Julia Crofty and Karen Obicock. And we are also working again on supermassive binary molecule merger in collaboration with Debico uh, Cartolini and Monica Colchi at the University of Minas in And if you are interested in reproducing our results, in all our recent paper, the initial data and gravitation we see are publicly available as they are part of the supplemental material of the paper. So when you go on the paper, you can just go to the supplemental material, you can download the gravitation we see, and then 